In 79 BC, the Roman Senate found itself in a dire situation, as for years its authority had been undermined. A civil war had created chaos around the nation, private armies had been raised, Italy herself had been invaded, and hundreds of senators had been killed. However, it was not all bad news for the Senate, as Sulla's retirement offered the Senate a chance to restore its authority. This wouldn't be easy, because fundamentally many soldiers took orders from their generals rather than the Senate. Both Marcus and Pompey got a taste of power during the Sullan period, and they were not going to give it up. Marcus was now a senator, so he chose to quietly work on his power base within the Senate. For years he increased his massive wealth, took capable men under his wing, and climbed the political ladder and finally ascended to the office of Praetor. Praetor was basically the second highest office in the Republic. Only consuls outranked them. A notable Roman politician, Lucius Sicinius, who harassed many political figures during this time, was later on asked why he left Marcus unharassed, to which he replied, because he had hay wrapped around his both horns. This nicely goes to show that Marcus brilliantly increased his influence in a way that it was barely even noticed. This way he avoided many problems and made his life a lot easier for himself. Perhaps the most troublesome character for the Senate was Pompey, who was one of Sulla's lieutenants. Just like Marcus, he had raised his own loyal troops and brought them to Sulla's cause. The problem for Pompey was that he was too young to hold any political office, which meant he couldn't become a senator, which in turn meant he couldn't lead any armies. Therefore, unlike Marcus, Pompey decided to build his career outside the Senate. Pompey's favorite tactic was to throw temper tantrums and use his soldiers to threaten the Senate to give him what he wanted. This way, Pompey got two military commands. First, to stop Lepidus from invading Rome, and secondly, to fight in Hispania against Tertorius, who had raised the local people in revolt. In 73 BC, a letter came from Capua, which stated that a group of slaves led by Spartacus and Crixus had carved a bloody route from their gladiator school. It was thought that the slaves would disperse quietly as they usually did, or be quickly suppressed by the local militia. Instead of this, the rebellion only got more severe as the local militia was soon defeated. Inspired by the victory, many slaves and free Italian peasants joined Spartacus. The Senate responded by sending Glaber with 3,000 soldiers to end the rebellion. Glaber quickly surrounded the slaves on a hilltop, but the slaves climbed down behind the Romans, surprising and defeating them completely. The slaves gained a brilliant victory, and more people flocked to their cause. The Senate sent another force, but it too was destroyed and its commander was embarrassed, as the slaves took his horse and forced him to flee on foot. In the beginning of 72 BC, the Senate was in panic. Spartacus and his slaves had defeated two praetors and were ravaging the countryside. For the Senate, the rebellion was a disaster, considering that it was not long ago when Rome was still in civil war, and many of the finest Roman soldiers were still fighting overseas. Marcus perhaps hoped he would get a chance against Spartacus, as he stayed in Rome instead of leaving to govern a province, as praetors usually do when they have been in office over a year. However, the matter had become so severe that to handle the issue the Senate turned to its two reigning consuls, Cornelius Lentulus and Gellius Publicola. Each consul raised about 6,000 men and left Rome to face the slave army. It's estimated that they would be facing a staggering 70,000 slaves. At first everything was going well for the consuls, as part of the slave army led by Crixus was destroyed and Crixus himself killed in action. After this, the consuls gave chase to the rest of the slaves, led by Spartacus, who were fleeing towards the Alps to get away from Rome. Spartacus, however, brilliantly turned his forces around and wiped out both consular armies. After this, Spartacus also defeated a local governor and his army in northern Italy. The revolt had reached its peak. The slave army was now about 120,000 strong, and the road out of Rome laid clear. However, Spartacus did not leave Rome. He instead turned back towards Italy and to the heart of Rome. 
His motives are not known, but likely he thought he could bring down the whole Roman system, and one could hardly blame him after such victories. Upon hearing of the recent events, the Senate was in full panic. Both consuls had returned to Rome in shame, and there was even talk of Spartacus coming to besiege the city. At this point, Marcus decided to offer his experience and wealth to the Senate, which was accepted without question. Even the defeated consuls supported Marcus, and thus the Senate called Marcus to save the Republic and gave him proconsular authority in Italy. Marcus quickly raised six legions from his own pockets and gathered the remnants of the consular armies. He also recruited the veterans of Sulla's forces, whom had settled in Italy. Marcus now had about 40 to 50,000 men, which was a mixture of inexperienced and veteran soldiers. He also took a number of ambitious senators to his staff, thus not wasting an opportunity to further his political influence. Marcus's strategy was to secure central Italy and force Spartacus to fight. This appeared to be working when one of Marcus's subordinates, Mumius, rashly attacked Spartacus but was soundly defeated. The men under Mumius were the same soldiers who were from the previously defeated consular armies. Upon hearing this, Marcus was furious and deployed an old Roman punishment called decimation upon the surviving defeated soldiers. In decimation, every tenth soldier would be clubbed to death by his fellow soldiers. Naturally, this was very brutal, but Marcus probably considered it to be necessary to keep his soldiers disciplined, which would be critical against Spartacus to avoid heavy casualties. Soon Marcus faced Spartacus on the field and managed to gain a victory. Spartacus was able to retreat to southern Italy, where he tried to flee to Sicily. Spartacus purchased transportation from pirates, who accepted payment but never delivered their promises. Marcus possibly had masterminded the betrayal. Spartacus now found himself in the toe of Italy, without being able to go anywhere but north where Marcus was waiting him with fortifications. Spartacus divided his army into two and broke out and made it to the inland, with Marcus in close pursuit. Marcus soon caught up the smaller slave army, trapped them between the wings of his army and mercilessly killed them. Marcus also recovered five legionary eagles and 26 leisure standards, along with many magisterial batches. Prior to the engagement of the smaller army, Marcus gave a portion of his troops to his officers, Tremilius Crofa and Quinticius. They were ordered to shadow Spartacus, who however showed he was still dangerous and managed to defeat this force. The victory was double-sided, since now Marcus had the time to catch up Spartacus. Spartacus made his last stand, but was no match for Marcus, who annihilated the slave army. Spartacus himself died during this battle, effectively ending the slave rebellion. As a clear message to all slaves, Marcus had about 6,000 live slaves crucified beside the road from Rome to Capua, which stretched about 190 kilometers. Marcus was celebrated as a hero of Rome. He now had a reputation to even match Pompey. Marcus had defeated an enemy which looked to be a threat to very existence of Rome. Not only that, Marcus had voluntarily offered his services, and as a private citizen raised an army and paid for it. Militarily speaking, this was his crown jewel and his first experience as the head of a huge army. But for the sake of things not going too well for Marcus, his old rival, Pompey, stepped up to the stage. Pompey had returned from Hispania and encountered few thousand runaway slaves and easily slaughtered them. After this, he sent a message to the Senate explaining that although Marcus had defeated the slaves in battle, it was he who had ended the war. Pompey certainly didn't have any lack of self-importance. Even in this time of relief, the Senate now faced a new problem, which could be even worse, as both Pompey and Marcus were approaching Rome with their loyal armies. Both would expect to be awarded for their campaigns. Neither man got along with the other, and with the First Roman Civil War freshly in people's mind, it was also feared that another blood-stained civil war would break out. The senators were holding their breath as both men arrived in Rome. 
Join us next time and see what happens when the two Rome's most powerful men meet. Thank you for watching.